Pacha Domnului. It's an honor for me to be this morning here again and share from the Word of God, and I will go straight into the message. For the message this morning, I will read the first three verses from Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1, the first three verses. The word of, of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against, against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went abroad, aboard, and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Amen. Now, um, this message came to me as, I w as we were worshiping last Sunday night. I don't know why God put this message on my heart, but um, there's a, an experience that I want to share with you that I had years ago when I was a teenager. Um, as many of you know, I grew up in Romania. Uh, I was 18 when I came here, so most of my formative years were back in Romania. And I remember going to Sunday school. And Sunday school was a little bit different in Romania than here. Uh, we had our teachers who started with us from when we were kids all the way to our teen years. And by the time we got to our teen years, so I was a teenager, um, they started testing us. Every few Sundays, based on the Bible study we did the, last, the Sundays before, they were give, giving us a test every, uh, every other or every third Sunday. And they were harder graders than we had at school. Um, and I was one of the top scorers for those tests. But somewhere where I was, I don't know, 15, 16 years old, something came to my mind and a verse from the Bible actually came to my mind. And the Bible says that you will be judged based on what you know. And what I took that verse to mean is that, okay, I know a lot. I'm passing these tests. That means that my punishment will be accordingly if I don't fulfill what I learned. So when I was about 15 or 16 years old, I decided, you know what? I will not study anymore. Because the amount of knowledge I have up to this point is enough for me. I don't need anything else because when he will judge me, I will know too much and then my punishment will be greater. And um, I stopped studying and I started failing purposefully, failing the tests. And I remember some of the Sunday school teachers asked me what's wrong and I would try to avoid answering and changing the subject. But that was my decision. And after a few weeks of failing, I realized that I know enough to be judged. I know enough. The fact that I'm already thinking the way I'm thinking, I know enough from the Word of God to have a greater responsibility than somebody who doesn't know. And I decided that it's time to give up that ignorance. It's time to move on. Now, what does this story, what does this personal experience have to do with the text I read today? In a way, uh, just think about it. When I was, you know, about 20 some years ago, I decided not to study the Word of God anymore because it would be too much of a responsibility. And now, I'm in front of you preaching the same Word of God that I was trying to run away from. And in a way, I'm, I was just like Jonah. Jonah was trying to run away from the call God have, has, ha, had given him, the call that God had put on his life. And in a way, I was trying to do the same thing. Now, you might ask, since this year is the year of consecration here at Agape Church, the year where 
All our messages, all the messages that you heard for almost a year now, had to do be, with being consecrated, being set apart for the Lord, uh, being devoted, dedicated to the Lord. Now, what does this message have to do with that? And as I, I was telling you, last Sunday night, I felt the Lord speaking to me as we were worshiping, especially the song where, you know, he knows my name. He knows my every thought. And I felt that there's still people here who are in Jonah's situation, and they're running away from the Lord. They're running away from the, God, the call God has for their life. And that could be twofold. They're running away from God's call of salvation. They're running away from God's salvation. They're running away from God's forgiveness, or those of us who are saved, we might be still running around from a specific call that God has for our life. And that's what I was doing back, you know, 20 years ago or so. I was trying to run away from God's specific call for my life. I was still going to church. I was still participating, but I was refusing to study the Word of God. I accepted Christ as my Savior, Lord and Savior, but I didn't want anything else. I didn't want anything extra. I was refusing that specific call. So tonight, this morning actually, sorry, um, I usually preach at night. Uh, this morning, I, I hope to learn, I will learn something, I hope you will learn something from Jonah's experience and stop running from God's call for your life. And let's look at a few things, a few truths that we could learn from, from Jonah's experience as he was running away from God's call uh, for his life. First, let's figure out why did he run? Why did Jonah run? First of all, you have to understand, Jonah was already a prophet. He was a true and faithful prophet. If we look in uh, 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, he's mentioned there. Um, he was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. He was already a prophet. He was already called to that uh, job that he had as a prophet of God. But what he was doing right now, he was r running from a specific call God had for him. Uh, he is sent to preach his message to Nineveh. And Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. At that time in history, they were Israel's greatest enemy. And if you study history, you will not find another empire as violent, as brutal, as cruel as the Assyrians. It seems that they were enjoying destroying other nations, destroying other civilizations. And God was asking him to go and preach this, his message to his enemies. And if uh, you look in verse 2, God says, go. In the original, the verse, uh, the translation actually says, rise and go. And then the beginning of verse 3 says, but Jonah ran away. And the original actually says, he rose. He did the first part of God's commandment, but he rose and fled. The word said, rise and go, but Jonah rose and fled. Now, why did he run away? Let's look at the map. Please put up the map that's in the PowerPoint, just to get an idea. Um, you see there the Middle East, he went down to Joppa, and he went in the opposite direction of, what, of where God was asking him to go. Tarshish was the westernmost point of the Mediterranean world. Uh, most of the people during that time, they had no idea that there was something beyond Tarshish. For them, that was the end of the world. 
While God was asking him to go to Nineveh, he went in the exactly opposite direction, the farthest known point at that time. Now, why such a drastic action? Uh, the first chapter of, of Jonah won't tell us that, but if we look uh, at the end of chapter 3, verse 10, and beginning of uh, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, we find out why Jonah was doing this. And chapter 3, verse 10 starts the following. When God saw that what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the distraction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Here we find the true reason Jonah chose to go in the opposite direction. He had a problem with God's theology. He, has a, he had a problem with God's way of working with people. He had a problem with God's grace. He had a problem with God's love. He was not particularly interested in the redemption of his enemies. He didn't like the Assyrians too much, and he knew that once he preached that message, that the end for them is near. If they repent, if they turn to God, God will forgive them. And he didn't like that. And my question to you t this morning is, why are you running away? Is it somehow that you disagree with the way God works? Do you disagree with the way um, he talks to your neighbor? Do you disagree with the way he deals with maybe your enemies? Do you disagree with God's way of working? There was another man in the Bible that disagreed with the way God was working, and that was Apostle Paul. Before he became Apostle Paul, he was persecuting the church. He was persecuting the Christians because he thought, why was he doing that? He thought that he was doing God's work. He was doing God's a favor by persecuting the Christians because he saw them as heretical. But on the way to Damascus, he met Jesus. On the way to Damascus, his theology changed. And I want you to look deep inside of you. If you're running from God, if you're not saved yet, and you're running away from God's salvation, if you're running away from God's forgiveness, or if you're running away from God's specific call for your life, look deep inside of you and find out why are you running away. Why are you trying to get away from God? Because the second truth that I learned from this passage is there's no place to run. We have no place to run. If you look in verse 4 from uh, Jonah uh, chapter 1, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. And then in verse 17 says, now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. First, God sends the storm, and Jonah is still soundly asleep below deck as the people whose lives he threatened. Okay, he refused to obey God's law. He, he refused to obey God's calling, and in his running away, he actually put in danger the sailors who were uh, sailing that ship to a starship, and he was still sound asleep. And then when he was found out, he actually wants to die. If you look in verse 12, and they throw him in the sea, and when he's in the sea, hoping to die that way, he doesn't have to fulfill his mission, he doesn't have to answer the call God gave him, God decides, I have something else for you, and sends a ship, uh, a fish, a big fish, who swallowed him. This reminds me of Psalm 139, uh, verses 7 through 12. And the Word of God says the following, 
Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like day, for darkness is a light to you. Jonah found there's no place to run. And hopefully this morning you find the same answer. There's no place. If you're running away from God, if you're running away from his call for your life, there's no place to run. There's no place to hide. Where do you plan on uh, running from your call, from your responsibility? What's going to be your excuse? Are you get, get involved in many activities and say, God, look at me. I'm so busy. I don't have time for this. Or... Are you going to try to drown out the voice of God by staying away from his church? By not coming to church? By not meeting with people who could remind you of God's voice? By avoiding your pastors, your youth leaders, avoiding God's people? How are you going to try to smother the voice of the Spirit? Because there's no place to run. Uh, Because even when you're on the run, the third thing I learned, there's going to be people who will question you. People who will ask you questions that actually are going to remind you of your calling. And that's what happened with Jonah and the sailors. Once they woke him up, because he was sound asleep during the storm, uh, there was an interesting conversation in Jonah uh, chapter 1. the sailors ask him a few questions in, chapter, in verses 6 and 8. First, how can you sleep? How can you sleep? Then, what do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? To this, Jonah answers with verse 9 and says, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. Then the sailors reply, they were terrified because they found out he's running away from God and says, they say, what have you done? Verse, first part of verse 10, what have you done? And then the last part of verse 11 says, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Because they know the God who made the sea and the land, the God who created this universe, can calm down the sea. And Jonah replies, pick me up and throw me into the sea and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon us, upon you. Now, the same questions that Jonah, Jonah was asked, I'm asking you this morning. I'm asking you, how can you sleep? What you know there's people around you who are going to be damned for eternity. You know they're going to go to hell for eternity because they don't know Christ. And how can you sleep when you know your friends that you spend most of your time with don't know Christ and they're going to, they're damned to hell? What do you do when those around you are asking you for help? When those around you are sinking? When those around you are dealing with the storms of this life? What do you do? When they ask you, where do you come or who are you? What's your identity? From, From what people are you? Can you stand up, especially in this society today and say, I'm of God's people. I'm one of Jesus' followers because I know the name of Jesus creates a lot of controversy controversy during this time. Are you part of the ones who are saved? Are you part of the saints? What's your identity? Where do you come from and where are you going? 
Do you know what's your destiny? Do you know what's your destination? And if you look at the sailors in this story, they understood the gravity of the situation. They understood that they were in a life or that situation. And from their conversation with Jonah, if you pay att close attention to what's going on, they actually forced Jonah to testify to them. He forced Jonah to wit they forced Jonah to witness. They forced Jonah to actually share his message for them. And as a result of Jonah's message, they actually turned to God. Even though at the beginning, they tried to do the same thing as Jonah did. They accepted God. They accepted that God was in control. But they, in verse 13, says, Instead, the men did their best to, rock, to row back to land. But they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. At first, they tried to do what Jonah did and run away from God, what God has told them to do. It was clear. God told them, throw Jonah into the sea and everything will be fine. And they said, nah, I think we could save him. I think we could save ourselves if we're going to row hard enough. We're going to get to the, sea, to the shore if we row hard enough. And that's what happens when we try to do it ourselves. We figure out, you know, I'm strong enough, I'm smart enough, I'm capable enough to do this myself. They didn't realize that the death of one man, in their case, Jonah, would save them all. And when they actually decided, finally, they surrendered to that idea that one man has to die for them, and they throw Jonah into the sea, they finally turned to God and said, in, in verse uh, 16 says, At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered the sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. They realized that one man, in their case Jonah, could save them. So in my conclusion this morning is, I don't know what you're running away from. Maybe you're like the sailors. You're running away from God's forgiveness. You're running away from God's plan for your life. Maybe it's hard for you to understand that you are a sinner and you need Christ to forgive you of your sins. Maybe it's hard for you to understand that without God's forgiveness, without Christ dying for your sins, you cannot be saved. You cannot do it through your own power. And everything that's in your life right now, all the storms, all the people that you have in your life asking you questions, point to that one man, point to Christ who died for your sins. And if you want to find peace, if you want to find redemption, if you want to find salvation, this morning I tell you, stop running and accept his forgiveness. Now, maybe you're running from you're saved, and you're running from God's specific call for your life. I want you to accept God's sovereignty in the way he works. Do not negotiate with God. Do not, you know, condition your participation in God's work. You know, say, God, if you do this, this way, my way, then I will do your work. No, accept his sovereignty. Do not run away. We have... Uh, a saying in Romanian says, Nu fi mai catolica, Papa. Don't try to tell God what to do and how he should do things. It's not your place to correct God's plan. It's not your place to tell God, you know, this is the way you should be working. Do not negotiate with him. And my advice to you, do not ignore the people God has put in your life. And they're directing you towards the calling that God has prepared for you. And do not ignore the storms that God has put in your life to direct you towards your calling. And I pray that this morning, this is a warning for you, as well as a waking up moment. That you stop running from God and start accepting His plan for your life. Amen.